Welcome to the brave new work on the Other Side crossover miniseries. In these short episodes, we talk with Chase Chapman, builder of DAOs and host of the On the Other Side podcast about organizational design for Web3. On with the show. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about product market fit and design caveats or perhaps design differences in how to think about self-managing organizations that have not found product market fit. So a little bit of context for this conversation, DAOs are definitely figuring out a lot of these self-management principles. I think the Ready has some really amazing learnings that DAOs can be just soaking up. One of the interesting things that I've noticed is it feels like at the Ready, I know that you consult on companies that are large, but Mm -hmm. also smaller. And I know the Ready is still an organization that's not, you know, massive, like a massive corporation. But it does feel like there's probably a distinction to be made between how large organizations that have found product market fit sort of move towards self-management versus organizations that are still very much finding product market fit. And one of the big things there for me is, okay, cool. If we want to design around the types of things that we need or the way that we need to serve users, the big question mark for a lot of DAOs is like, who are our users? (laughs) And so I think one of the big things that I want to get at is what is different or perhaps like are there different frameworks we need to be thinking about for organizations that are still finding product market fit versus these organizations that already have product market fit and are now, you know, growing or expanding or whatever it might be. I I hear you and I feel like I have one foot in both camps right now because on the one hand, we're building the ready, which has customers that know us and pay us and ha- has a business model and is profitable. And then we have Murmur, that's a very early stage software platform that is still somewhere in that hunt, but also trying to operate in a in a self-managed way. The way I think about this is that at the end of the day, if you're if you're building something from scratch, you're on a search for the fit between the problem that you're trying to solve or the focus area that you care about the customer target and the product or service that you're going to build to to fulfill it. And what is really unusual to me about DAOs is sometimes I think they mistake their membership for the target customer. And and sometimes their membership is one-to-one overlapping with the customer in the real world anyway. So there's a lot of blurred lines that aren't present when you just have a designer, an engineer, and a product person around the table trying to create something without that customer contact. So I do think that we need to unpack what are the sorts of things that small groups need to do in a DAO to go find out, to build things that will then be the trial balloons to find out what works, and what is the role of this broader community in that search. So how does that land with you both? To me, that is like one of the biggest challenges that I know a lot of DAOs are facing right now, which is figuring out what is the role of three different people. One is our users Mm -hmm. who actually use whatever we're doing. Sometimes your users could be members of your community. In the case of something like FWB, which is Friends with Benefits, which is like a social DAO. But in a lot of cases, if you're building a product, let's say, it's just your users of a product. Then you have your community, which the way we currently define it is people who vibe with you, which is a really (laughs) confusing thing. It's often people in your Discord, sometimes people who hang out in your Twitter spaces, maybe people who write some stuff for you, but we're Mm -hmm. really not sure how to define that. And then we have contributors who feel like these are the employees of what would be a company, but is instead a DAO. And I think the community part is the one where we're like, what? (laughs) And that is where my brain gets really confused in some of this framing, because that does feel kind of new in the sense that it's just people who vibe with your organization instead of people who are either using it or actually building things within it. And in some ways, it's a huge advantage because I know so many Web2 startups that are dying for community to support their 
endeavor and they do have a product and they do have a solution, but nobody cares. <laughs> nobody showed up to the party. And so when you do have one that has community around it, like Notion, for example, you see this massive lift and this real support because technically the community can be your marketing and it can be your data gathering and it can be your recruiting engine and it can be all these things, your first customers even, that we really struggle with, I think, in the Web2 world by comparison. What seems to be the gap, and I'm curious what you would add to this, Rodney, but the gap I see is that often if the core contributors or the or the early contributors of the DAO don't have a clear enough vision to paint for what are we trying to do, what are we trying to, you know, what's our dent in the universe? What are we trying to solve or change in the world? Then it becomes a little bit of just a, a kind of fomenting conversation. And then it like becomes a discussion about alpha somewhere else. And there just isn't anywhere to go with it, as opposed to really planting a flag and being like, we exist to solve this problem in the world. This set of core contributors is cooking up a solution or a, you know, a beta or something, an alpha to play with. And what we need from the community is we need insight and data and reactions and feedback and promotional support and, and references and things like that. And it becomes much more mission oriented. That seems to me to be one of the cloudier spaces, in part because they don't know, and in part because maybe they don't even know how to talk about what their intentions are, especially if they have very broad, diverse fun NFT DAO style plans. Yeah, I I think community cultivation is tricky in any scenario. Um, <laughs> but particularly where there's no like physical place or a real constraint, it, it takes on a different life. So I, I think to Aaron's point, something that is often resisted when we're talking about community is understanding the purpose and what the exchange is between the community and its platform. And and I don't mean that in like a shitty capitalist transactional way, but it's like, why why are you here? Like the Wikipedia community understands what it's doing there. Like it's there to contribute to Wikipedia so that we have Wikipedia. That's dope. And like there's a lot of incentive baked in to hang around and contribute there. I think in a lot of less structured and less mature communities, there is a real question because the barrier to entry is incredibly low. There's no like clear, you know, we're not super clear on the light that's meant to draw the mosquitoes. So we're just attracting lo lots and lots of potentially curious folks. And then there's not a lot of clarity of like, okay, well now, now what, like now what are we going to do here? And I think one of the missed opportunities and, and Chase, I'd love to hear, you know, maybe where you've seen this work or not work is, you know, if you, if you assume that the people who vibe and are showing up are potential users or might understand potential users, then like in what way is the community helping with experimentation? And like, what is the disciplined practice around asking our community to try a bunch of shit, Plus give one. us data and feedback so that we are so that we are steering our way toward product market fit with real users who may or may not ultimately be a member of that community? It's interesting because I feel like in Web3, we're a little bit confused about the definition of community. Okay. Because there's community in the way that we're talking about it right now, which I think is super helpful and makes sense. It's usually people who are otherwise users of your product or adjacent to users and can be helpful in some way because of that position. Mm. What's interesting about, I think, where DAOs are at right now is that we have users who are engaged, and that's definitely one group. We also have token holders who just want the value of the token to go up maybe, or even if that's not explicitly or even like in their heads what they want. They're sort of there partially because of the financial reasons. And then you also have this broader lens of like all these different sort of players with different reasons for being there of, hey, this is the future of work. And so any value you provide should be compensated. Mm. And in that world, things become, I think, a little bit weirder because it becomes much less clear where someone goes from being a community member who adds value to a contributor who should be paid because they're helping build effectively a product or market a product or whatever. And so I feel like that's part of where things get messy too, is just that 
we don't quite know if community just means people who are on their way to becoming full-time contributors or if it really is like this group of engaged super users who want to help out or investors who want to help out, you know? And so I think that's part of the weirdness too is like, that's a really messy (laughs) concentric (laughs) circle set that we're not quite sure where different things fit. And now we come to the conversation of roles. Yay! Because at the end of the day, what you're talking about is a delineation of roles, which also represent different membranes around the organization. So it's absolutely true that you have token holders, and those would be called you know, investors, shareholders in traditional parlance. And in most ecosystems, they, they are not well included and well involved. I mean, even VCs get you know, a monthly update, and that's about it. But in these systems, there's a lot more transparency and involvement. So I think that could be a good thing. But the question becomes, just being a token holder, an investor, a shareholder is a role. And that role should have certain expectations and certain decision rights and certain opportunities. And then there are other roles that are more specific to contribution that are compensated differently, that are rewarded differently, et cetera. So to me, it's about the the core project, figuring out what do we need from this community, which is probably a set of different facets and types of role holders. And what do we need from each party? And what are we willing to to reward or to pay for to get what we need? And literally just start baking those roles in, in governance. Here's a role for what it means to be a token holder and what that affords you. And it's a lot like what is happening intuitively in Discord with different roles that people hold, but they're limiting the blast radius of that division to discord when actually what they need is they probably need it everywhere else a lot more than they needed in discord like it's nice to be in special channels and have some sense of status in in a discord community that this person is in the project or out but there's a lot more fine tuning that could be done at a role basis that says this is a role that's multi-filled by a bunch of different people in the community and this is a role that's filled by one person that has actual responsibilities and actual work that it needs to get done So, yeah, that's where my head goes immediately. I don't know if you would add anything, Rodney, but it's like role work 101. Yeah. The thing I would add that I haven't yet seen in a DAO, which certainly doesn't mean it doesn't exist, is is like what is the base member role that everyone is holding? Yeah. And and what are the attendant accountabilities and expectations and decision rights or whatever around that base member role? And and given like <laughs> given the permeability of the membranes um, around DAOs at the moment, it, they could be very very small. Like the the amount of real expectation around that most basic community member role could be minimal, but it should be something. It should be like to be even in here, you're doing something besides like reading right. our don't be an asshole onboarding checklist. And then that's <laughs> it. Now you're in the community. Even if you never come back here, like, no, that's not, you know, it's like a lot of conversations we've had, Chase. It's like healthy gardens don't grow if you don't ever weed them. So you have to put a little bit of constraint around a container if you want really good shit to happen. And and so you know, I would think about it rather than like in any sort of top down way, I would think of it in a bottom up way, which is like, what is the lowest or the least engaged form of member? Okay, everybody here has that. Okay, now in addition to that, we have token holders. Okay, what do they get to do? And what do we ask of them? Okay, over here, maybe we have advocates. And these are just people in the community that when we send them a com and we ask them to tweet it, they fucking do it. Now, maybe on top of our base member role, we have contributors. And those are just people who are like doing projects, you know, t- taking on what comes. Now we have other roles that are more specialized and are more core to our business. And this doesn't have to be a super, super heavy lift. Again, like the kind of role agreements Aaron and I are talking about are things that would fit on a quarter of a page. But but what you want to get at is the atomization of what we are actually doing rather than being like, what is a community even? <laughs> And what is the filter on each of those roles? Yeah, yeah. Right? Because like getting to the Discord, okay, that's one thing. Verifying that I have a token, that's another thing. But once you leave that, there isn't a lot of Web3 answer for what to do next, how to filter the next tier of the story. And so that's where I think having criteria for the roles, having a little bit more understanding of what skills people are bringing to the table, having 
trial projects and opportunities. And I have seen DAOs do a really good job lately with like seasons of onboarding and opportunities to get to know what people are capable. Like that stuff is starting to bubble up, which is great. And I have a lot of confidence that it will organically find its way. But I think with just, yeah, with a more deliberate hand, it could go faster and be less, you know, disruptive. What's really interesting from when I'm watching my brain, I always say interesting, I need a new adjective, but (laughs) I'm watching my brain as you talk about this. And I'm like, yep, that totally makes sense, 100%. And then I'm watching the other side of my brain, which is like, oh my God, but no, if we have roles, then like, how does emergence happen? And how Mm -hmm. do we make sure these systems are flexible? And who decides what these roles are? That's just tyranny, which is, I'm sure, not correct. But what would you respond to my unhinged Web3 brain on on that? It's it's just minimum viable constraint. So tyranny is we're going to design every role in this place and some power holder is going to determine who can fill them for how long, at what amount of money or token, et cetera, et cetera. And chaos is, you know, kindergarten soccer. We'll just all be here hanging out and hope stuff happens, which, you know, we saw f- an interesting example today of how that doesn't always go down. So to me, the, the, the third option here that is neither tyranny nor chaos is what, what are the minimum viable constraints that you need? Like if you want to have a vibrant community, what should be going on? What should every single member of that community be? expected to do. It might be something as simple as contribute to a Discord conversation once a week. That to me is like if 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 people don't want to like show up and even be in the conversation, should they really be there? I don't know. That's an interesting question. But but I think the the way to like quiet that part of the monkey mind is to be like we only create the constraints we need to keep us on the rails and no more than that. And we'll have more time for more roles, more structure, more agreements as we need them, but we're not going to do the most. We're going to do the least that we need, <laughs> in fact, to 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 be able to have things emerge. You know, nothing emerges without constraint. Totally. And I'm so glad you finished on that because what I've been sitting here jumping up and down about is the word emergence is thrown around a lot in this market and in this space. And I'm not sure everyone understands what it means, but actual emergence, the patterns that we see in complex adaptive systems like flocks of birds and neurons and colonies of ants, etc., they're all built on simple rules. The rules of a you know murmuration of birds can be written down in three lines of code, but they're there. And they, those rules dictate how the agents behave that allows the structure to emerge. It allows the colony to form. It allows everything to survive. If you take those rules away, the birds literally cannot flock. And so I think that's the part here is is what Rodney's describing is you have to encode your simple rules and they can be very simple. But if you don't have any, you can't actually see structure emerge. What ends up emerging is just more chaos. Yeah, it's just soup on the floor. And, you know, (laughs) I used to be, yeah, we need cans, cans for our soup. I I used to be a really serious musician and I was a classically trained musician. And and I often think like, you know, what classical music and jazz have in common is scales. We all, we all fucking play them all the time, all day. And when people see great jazz bands or combos doing a lot of improvisation, that feels emergent, and it is, but they're all using the same foundational scale. They are using the constraints of like a key signature and measurement and timing and (laughs) trading eight bars, et cetera. And what happens inside those eight bars is magic. And that is what emergence is meant to be. But it's not a bunch of dudes off the street who wander into a jazz club, pick up any <laughs> fucking instrument that they see laying on the floor and start playing their own That's song. That's atonal jazz. Yeah. <laughs> atonal jazz is still grounded in the same I know, music theory. I, know. I will just take you to the floor. I'm just okay. making a little joke. I'm just making a little joke. But yeah, that's, I think that's, that's the thing. Is like we don't want soup on the floor. We don't want birds you know, falling from the sky. And on that note, I think that's a perfect way to close this out. I love the soup and the birds and the jazz. <laughs> I got very into metaphor at the end. It sounds like a wild children's book. It is. We should, we make, should that. make one. I love it. 
This was a wonderful conversation. The idea of having these constraints, I think, is incredibly important. And a lot of the roles that we're thinking about in DAOs today just are very much something that I think we avoid a conversation around or don't have enough of those constraints. So that feels like a really big call to action and also an important part of conversations that I've been having that I feel like we've almost been beating around the bush of. And so this is finally my moment to be like, okay, fine. We need to define these nice. and we need to make it clear. <laughs> nice. Pull the bandaid. That's another episode of Brave New Work on the Other Side in the Bag. There's more where that came from, so watch for new episode drops coming soon. And this special crossover edition is produced by The Ready in partnership with Chase Chapman and On the Other Side. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at theready.com or find all three of us on Twitter. As for you, thanks for listening. Now go Dow something.